gap widening between me and them. Uh, they're certainly online all the time. They get their information from uh, Wikipedia. I know as a developmental psychologist, Piaget's theory says, you know, hands-on learning is the best way. Uh, things have to be meaningful and we have to um, <coughs> construct knowledge ourselves and learn to do things to, uh, to learn better. So I was feeling the gap widening. I was feeling the introductory psychology course that I'm teaching is not really um, as exciting as it could be. Uh, for students, uh, and Megan is going to tell us about a model that kind of guided our vision for this. Okay, so we wanted to apply the assignment to a motivational model to see how the aspects of the assignment could increase student motivation. So we have the ARCS model of instructional motivation. It's based on the expectancy values models of motivation, which look at how a person's expectations for success and their personal incentives can interact to initiate behavior or motivate behavior. The expectations for success are influenced by a person's past experiences or self-efficacy, um, and incentives are their goals and values. So this instructional model is interaction-based. It looks at how the environment of the classroom interacts with a person's personal traits to um, initiate behavior and to influence learning. So this particular model has been validated across several research studies across different cultures and several levels of learning. Okay, so there's four categories for the model. The four categories are attention, satisfaction, relevance, and confidence. And all the categories have several subcategories that are used to target motivational downfalls um, and increase motivation among students for those categories. We looked up the literature on Wikipedia and we learned that um, its accuracy is comparable to um, Encyclopedia Britannica according to uh, a science magazine article that it's, that it's heavily used um, by, uh, by college students uh, in general, much more than uh, library web uh, uh, databases. Um, uh, that uh, despite being heavily used, it's not heavily edited by the users. So uh, while 80% of students read Wikipedia article very regularly or regularly, uh, about 80% of students never write uh, or edit um, Wikipedia articles. So we felt like responsibly engaged educators and students should really do something about it and um, uh, and uh, <laughs> encourage you know contribution to Wikipedia. Um, the uh, I went to the um, Psychological Association uh, American Psycho uh, Association for Psychological Sciences uh, convention uh, a couple years ago, and uh, a Wikipedian who is actually in the blue shirt back there. Uh, uh, you were there at the APS and you gave a presentation on the Wikipedia initiative and how the association is encouraging uh, faculty to engage their students uh, there. And I was just fascinated by that because I was right there, you know, wanting to, to uh, be kind of more updated and modern in some way. So I joined and decided to try it on that intro psych course that I felt really had a motivational uh, problem there. Um, the Wikipedia assignment replaced the major traditional kind of research paper in the course. Uh, the students worked in teams of four um, and uh, selected a topic to write on a new article or expand an already existing article on in an encyclopedic fashion. So no personal opinion, but doing like a literature search uh, on the topic. And uh, also each student did an individual component where they completed a peer review of um, other articles and edited some other articles on uh, Wikipedia as a kind of a warm up uh, assignment to them. And you can see the assignment deadline. There was a lot of things for the students to read. Uh, very helpful resources that Wikipedia puts on, lots of good tutorials. Uh, most students did not go there at all. <laughs> it was, um, actually just word of mouth and asking each other how did you figure this out and trial and error and asking me which you know I'm no expert so we're kind of trying to find it out so that was uh, you know I think one of the points I want to talk about 
Um, the goals for the assignments kind of mirrored or uh, were, were the basis for the survey that we later used in the course. Uh, so we tried to write questions assessing each of those particular goals uh, that the assignment aimed at. Um, we had 37 students in the class and they all filled that survey as well as open-ended questions and a, uh, a subset of them um, participated in a focus group uh, four months after the course was done because we wanted to see the long-term you know, engagement with Wikipedia uh, after this. The course was uh, 15 weeks and uh, we administered the survey at the end of the course. Um, Megan is going to tell us about uh, the results of the survey and uh, our composition, uh, the class composition, mostly freshmen and sophomores were in that course uh, and um, uh, mostly female, kind of mirrors the uh, demographics of the campus as well, more females than males. So, so uh, as was discussed, we had our survey that was given out. Uh, it provided the quantitative and qualitative data for our study. There were 30 learning objectives that we looked at initially and students rated these on a scale of five from helping or from improving not at all on those objectives to improving very much so. There were also six before and after questions that looked at the students' perceptions of the assignment, their confidence in it, um, and the value that they placed on the assignment before and after. And then lastly, there were the open-ended questions that provided the qualitative data. Um, and that was mainly focusing on the rewarding and frustrating parts of the project, as well as improvements for future projects. So here are all of the first 30 survey questions. They mainly focus on things that would help students in their college years in all of their classes, but also specific to psychology, You know, looking at psychology research methods, uh, collaborating, things that would be beneficial in postgraduate studies as well. So these are 13 of the 30 objectives that were significantly higher than our midpoint on our scale. So they are the ones that we, ha we judge uh, the uh, assignment really, really helped improve the student's skills for. So the 13 objectives can be split into four categories. The first and the largest of the categories is an improvement in research and writing skills. So those are listed up there. There is also a great benefit from the collaboration. Students felt like they really improved their collaboration skills, which is a very important skill for all college students. There were improvements in learning strategies, such as taking and giving criticism and learning from experience. And something that I think is really exciting is the increased awareness. The students found that they <coughs> had an increased understanding of knowledge as interconnected and of the interactive um, nature of learning. So these are the before and after questions that we posed to the students. The students' interest in engaging in the project and their appreciation of the project did not significantly increase, but their confidence in their ability to take on the project and succeed at it did significantly increase after the project. All right. For the open-ended questions, um, we asked them what you found most rewarding, and overwhelmingly, it was the fact that they're contributing to something real and permanent, something that other people will see and will continue to build on and will have an impact in the world. Um, followed by uh, working with classmates, communicating with people worldwide, you know, on the internet, and feeling like uh, they're part of a community of scholars and researchers. And um, um, uh, quite a few students also mentioned um, really getting a better understanding of Wikipedia and uh, appreciating how well reviewed it is and how um, highly reliable it is. A lot of them were surprised because they were taught in high school, never you know, use Wikipedia for research, it's just not a reliable source. And they could see for themselves how much their uh, work was edited and commented on. Uh, most frustrating aspect uh, overwhelmingly was the coding. Uh, so I'm so glad to hear uh, Jimmy Wales this morning talking about the Visual Editor Initiative. Yes, I, that's exactly what uh, we need. Um, the coding was, especially for references and for images, uh, was really complicated uh, for students. And again, even though the great tutorials are there, students are just not 
used to that. They're mm -hmm. used to menu-driven, you know, window-driven kind of applications and not writing code uh, at all. I was a computer science minor in college, so to me it wasn't such a, you know, I was like, oh yeah, sure, the students, but most students aren't really um, trained on that. Um, getting the work deleted was really uh, frustrating. Uh, negative interactions with some editors, even though I had all the students write on their top pages, on their um, pages that they are students doing a uh, project for the class, and I registered the course before we started with Wikipedia and all that. Uh, some editors just did not know and thought that they are, it's a sock attack when they're uh, fixing references <laughs> or when they're doing something wrong and they deleted the work and uh, students were really intimidated by that. Um, needing to find a source for everything, I think that's a gain, <laughs> even though it's frustrating for them, that's good, you know, training. Um, suggestions for improvement, uh, overwhelmingly in-class demos. We had asked for um, an ambassador, a Wikipedia ambassador, there was none on campus or anywhere around that could help us. Uh, so we're kind of relying on each other, but uh, a few of the students from that class volunteered to be kind of the helpers for future classes and come to class and show, and this is exactly what students need. In class demos, maybe two sessions, you know, two 15 minute sessions of just demo, here's how you do it. Um, uh, extensive uh, tutorial, you know, was not really right online, but they wanted in class uh, and just the, the, the things they need to do at the moment. Um, some suggested higher level classes could be better because they were still learning how to use the campus library, the freshman students, how to acclimate to the dorms, and it was just an added thing that they need, and they're learning psychology for the first time, so they thought maybe for higher level courses. So actually my goal next time, I'll try it with senior students in the senior capstone uh, seminar, uh, writing on topics and see how, how that works. And more help in selecting topics. The um, Psychological Association, APS, had a very helpful portal that suggested some topics that need development, but the students, need, there was like 60 topics to choose from. The students really needed more, like just give us two to choose from. Uh, what are the best uh, articles to work on? So, um, focus group, four months later, we asked them what were the most rewarding aspects of the project. Permanence, again, popped up. Uh, group work um, was, uh, Next in line, uh, most frustrating uh, aspects, coding still, you know, uh, and uh, intimidation. Just looking at articles, you know, the featured articles and stuff, like how can I ever get it uh, to that level, uh, being a freshman, you know, in the field. And then interactions, negative interactions or hostile interactions uh, were really a big source uh, of frustration for them. Uh, some editors, they said, were very helpful and just showed them, here's what you're doing wrong with all those references. That you know, this you know, bracket or parentheses or something, uh, but some editors just didn't give them that benefit of the doubt, you know, that Mary talked about in the morning, they just assumed they are um, spamming. Or, uh, we asked the students, are you still editing now that you uh, know? And um, some um, mostly not said no, uh, but some said yes, uh, now that I learned it, you know, why not? I'll continue doing it, but maybe not for a major article or major edit of an article, but adding a reference here or there or adding a sentence here or there for topics that interest me. Um, would you work on more articles in the future? Um, again, they felt like after I figured out the coding and I'm confident using it, it's kind of a waste, I'd like to do it. But it's a time issue and also an intimidation uh, issue. Uh, the fear that I could do h more harm than good, you know, uh, popped up um, in, their, in their talk. <coughs> um, so to close with the model again. Okay, so now to look again at motivation and how the Wikipedia assignment applied to the ARCS model because it's our assumption that if you can increase motivation, you'll increase the deeper learning for the students. So for the attention category, um, the Wikipedia assignment was able to gain the students' attention because it was different from the regular assignment. Normally we would have the eight page research paper. So this was something different, that was great. It also was a very multi-dimensional task. It was long-term, required many skills, moderately challenging, um, and uh, it was web-based and interactive, so that was good for the students. Research is always involving problem solving. You have to figure out what you wanna know and how you're gonna find it. But this added additional problem solving because it was new to the students. They had to figure out how to do it, and then also they had to figure out how to fix the critiques that they were given. For the relevance of the students, they need to know why this is important for them. The present worth was the excitement, the newness, getting to work with their peers, 
Students always like to work with their peers, do group work, delegate work. And then for the future usefulness, you have all of the different advancements that they made educationally and personally, things that were gonna help them in the future in college courses and at maybe grad school. And then for confidence, the students need to know what they have to do in order to succeed in their assignment. So that was given with the learning requirements that w were put together for them. For self-confidence, being able to apply what they learned directly after learning it improved self-confidence. And the results of the survey did show that their confidence in being able to complete the assignment did increase afterwards, so that's good. And then for minimizing anxiety, uh, there were individual due dates, which lessened the burden of the project, and also the, uh, the suggestions for the students for future projects could be used to minimize anxiety. And then for satisfaction, students need to be satisfied with their learning experience. The positive outcomes were everything that they gained personally, but also the fact that they had something that was on Wikipedia that could still be added to, something that was more than just a paper. The effective evaluation, the articles were graded on a rubric, except the main focus of the grading was what they left behind on Wikipedia. The students edited until their articles were accepted by the Wikipedia community, and their efforts were graded based on that. So this again is the model, and it shows just all the different dimensions of motivation and how important it is to target those with your individual assignments and the course in general. And I did think the motivation was reaching the good article status, which was uh, um, you know a goal in the course. I said all the nine articles, the, there was nine groups working on nine articles, and I said you all need to achieve good article status or at least try to, and three out of the nine did. Uh, and that was really motivating to them and to the others, you know, who kind of saw that. And some, some of the groups uh, continued working on their articles for months after the class uh, is done and achieved. So we only had one good article <coughs> status um, on the last day of the class, three uh, a couple months later. So they continued working for sure. And now the, one of the groups is also working on making it a featured article. Their article has been cited by over 100,000 uh, or like viewed by over 100,000 viewers, and they find that incredibly motivating. Uh, another group that were, uh, wrote an article on asexuality, I was on a listserv, you know, with um, counseling psychologists, and one was like, uh, there are students who are asexual on campus, and I don't know how to counsel them, and I can't find any information on asexuality. And another person in the listserv said, check that Wikipedia article, it's really helpful, it's really well done. And that was the one done by my students, I forwarded it to the students, and they felt so motivated, so proud. Uh, of it. Uh, so, so, what what um, help uh, you know? What advice you know? I would uh, give to future uh, instructors planning to do Wikipedia in the class. Familiarize yourself with Wikipedia editing before the course started. Uh, I was kind of confident that I'll get um, an ambassador who will save me and show me everything. We never got one uh, assigned to us, and I had to learn as we go, and the students were, were surpassing me, actually, in learning. But it was kind of frustrating for them when they come to me for questions and say, anybody in the class know the answer? And they usually is someone who figured out the answer, but uh, it's better as an instructor to definitely uh, learn that before. Uh, recruit someone comfortable with editing and design. Uh, so in the class, we had three or four students who said, oh, I'm very comfortable with that. I never did it, but I'm very comfortable. I could do that. And they acted as the, you know, the mentors for uh, the rest of the class. Uh, also, when we were assigning groups, we tried to place the students who are very nervous about the assignment with one of those uh, comfortable ones, so that worked uh, nice. Uh, minimize anxiety, so not a lot of points on it, a lot of uh, intermediate deadlines for little steps along the way, uh, a lot of one-on-one. -on -one uh, consultation would also help. Um, uh, what suggestions do we have for attracting and sustaining uh, new Wikipedians, new contributors uh, to Wikipedia? Definitely programming. Uh, so again, that uh, visual uh, editor initiative would be really helpful if the code is made uh, simpler and sort of menu-driven uh, editing. Uh, more support for students. So, um, and I hear there is uh, some courses now have, there's a limited number of courses that will be granted permission to use Wikipedia assignments, so they're gonna keep track better, I think. Wikipedia is gonna keep better track of uh, courses that are part of the um, editing initiative, and hopefully that comes with more 
uh, support as well for students and just knowing these are students learning, they're not you know, ill-intentioned spammers or anything. Um, more information on how students can solicit feedback or get questions answered. So sometimes they posted questions uh, and didn't hear back from anybody for a few weeks and in the course of 15 weeks, you know, a couple weeks is a lot of you know, time behind. We had one group that was starting a new article from scratch and never got it you know, started by the end of the 15 weeks. So they got, they got it deleted and got feedback and then they tried to edit it to meet the, uh, the requirements and the comments they got and they never heard back from the editor. So yeah, to uh, deal with that. Uh, more connections and contacts with uh, faculty. Um, you know, I was never contacted uh, by anybody from Wikipedia, but I was contacted by people from the uh, APS Wikipedia Initiative, uh, the lady who, who uh, designed the portal and was programming it, and that was just incredibly helpful. She, she helped me with a lot of things. Um, how to workshops for faculty. I wish, you know, um, at the, like the APS next year, uh, a how to workshop. You know, we had a talk about, you know, how to uh, get it started and how to design the assignment, but how to actually edit. Um, and things like the APS uh, portal were really helpful, so uh, I hope that continues. Thank you very much for your attention. articles on Wikipedia and see what style and just copy that style. <laughs> you know, so I said, right. there's none of your, it's likely a literature review. You're reviewing the literature on a subject, so everything is literature driven. It's not an opinion piece or anything like that. And I, none of my students had that issue. Uh, the issues that they got uh, responses from, from the editors was more like the references were not edited correctly or too many changes were done in one day and that raised suspicion, things like that. But uh, I didn't have an issue with uh, non-encyclopedic type writing, because early on we drilled it on. And they are professional students, so they've never written a paper in psychology. <laughs> it's kind of you know, easy to say, this is what we're looking for, not your opinion at all. Right. Well, I mean, you know, between opinion and argument, there's still a huge step, but, but typically what you see is that they, they sort of develop like an essay, yeah. which, is a, which is a very different way. Yeah. I also looked at the plan, so we had I had individual meetings with the groups to look at their plan for the article. What do they plan? How do they plan to improve the article? And so I did catch some of those that want to say, well, this you know statement kind of value statements, and I said, not really, you know, you're just gonna. Review. So we had, they had some guidance with that too. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, <coughs> any suggestions on how to get other institutions to adopt this kind of uh, a course or program? I'm a grad student. I um, push my uh, faculty advisor to suggest 
to the other uh, uh, staff there that they, they introduce a uh, edit Wikipedia course assignment that mm -hmm. went nowhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, I found the representative at the conference at the Association for Psychological Science. He had a booth and he had a couple of sessions all day, you know, sessions running all day that you could uh, go and tell you about. That was really helpful. I would have never done it if it wasn't for that session because I didn't know it existed or that I could do it. Um, my, our campus uh, published a little article in the campus uh, news, uh, newsletter or magazine about our initiative, and I got already calls from two faculty member, members who want to implement it and go, can you give us a workshop on campus about how to do this, and uh, can you tell me I want to start it next semester? So I think, you know, getting the word out in your campus literature would also help, or a summer workshop for faculty, a development workshop would help get them engaged. When, you know, when, when it comes, my experience is when, when it comes to, you know, fostering students to Wikipedia, it's essential that the professors spend some time themselves yeah. editing Wikipedia, working on improving articles, determining the performance of referencing requirements, and that was a lot of the problems we as Wikipedians face. We get these profs who come and they bring however many students, the profs, some of them have little understanding of how Wikipedia works, they then can't give proper feedback, exactly. and everybody just ends up unhappy. You know, the students right. end up unhappy because of the reaction of the community, the community ends up unhappy because the students aren't sure what they're doing. But the successful process we've had, like John Easy Murray out of uh, Vancouver, you know, he became a Wikipedia himself, he's made, you know, uh, 15, 20,000 edits, he's an administrator, he's very involved, yeah. and he became very involved with Wikipedia before he brought it. Mm -hmm. So yes. we need to make sure we're getting props. Absolutely. Um, it would be great if it's part of the culture of how professors are evaluated or rewarded. Uh, because yeah, I would love to be editing 20,000 articles, except it's not going to get me promoted or tenured, right? Um, well, so we're, we're, <laughs> we're, 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 <laughs> there is there is one I heard. We're, yeah. we're, we're, we're working on changing that. Yes. You know, right now I'm, I'm working on a collaboration with the Bureau of Medicine and, and Open Medicine. Yes. And they're interested in taking with the articles right. and publishing them, getting them PubMed index, yes. and then you know the authors of those journals, all the authors of the articles will get academic credit. That's abs that makes perfect sense to me. Because I've published in places where there's zero people who read my work. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas Wikipedia, you know, so it should, if anything, get more credit and be yeah. more acknowledged as scholarly contribution. So, so our trial just started. The first article in publication um, on dengue fever. You know, the, the two journals I'm working on really deal with medicine rather than, than other topics. But, uh, but yeah. you know, hopefully it's once great. we get this going, we can pull other journals in. Right. And then, you know, there's a co-publication strategy and the professors can get the academic recognition they need, get tenure, right. and Wikipedia can end up with you know academic contributors and entry content. So you not only get your content read, but you can get academic That's great. That's great. Yes. I wonder if you thought about asking for help from your reference and instruction librarians. Um, at my institution, which is Colgate University, um, the librarians will partner with faculty. And um, we typically have a faculty We had one session with a librarian, uh, one class session, uh, specifically for that project, uh, and that was very, very helpful. So we, we pulled up a Wikipedia article and said, okay, so the statement doesn't have a reference. How do we find a reference? So, you know, and the difference between secondary sources and primary sources, and then um, the students went and into that article and added the references that were missing. So this is part of the warm-up exercise. It was very, very helpful and great. No.
Um, hi. So I just want to say, um, so first of all, I, I think listening to what you've done is, is really great, especially without, uh, you said you didn't have an ambassador. Um, I'm actually against Ambassador Georgetown, so we work with the U.S. Education Program. Um, so there, there are a lot of resources for, I don't know if there's a regional ambassador in your area, um, to get in touch until we start um, a more official program with, um, there is a large outreach program for these sorts of projects. Um, if anyone, if you or anyone else is interested, we're actually, there's a meetup on Friday uh, evening at 5.30, um, over just over in Georgetown. Yeah, I'm going to that Yeah, so um, that'd be a great place to, to just meet up with people. I know uh, Leanna Davis, who uh, runs, the, runs that outreach program, will be there and, and a lot of other people. That's on my calendar, yeah. Um, as regards to projects from the from the student viewpoint, was the intent to uh, to study how to interact with Wikipedia, or was it to um, to engage with the psychological research um, using Wikipedia as a tool? And as a psychologist, do you have any plans to study Wikipedia engagement in the classrooms mm -hmm. uh, in terms of knowledge retention and mastery uh, among students? Um. That would be interesting, you know, a uh, long-term uh, research project or, you know, follow-up for this uh, research uh, project. Uh, the intention was really to have them engage with psychological material and learn how to cite sources and how to do thorough research um, while also engaging in a medium that is interesting and motivating to them. Um, and, and again, overwhelming the students that that was really uh, intriguing to them, that they knew their paper isn't just going to end up in my drawer um, and never to be read again. That was motivating to them. So th that was my goal. My goal. But um, as you can see in the focus group, we also did ask, did you continue to edit? You know, are you now that you learned the skill, uh, why not? And so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm worried about time. Sh maybe we should uh, take questions, you know, afterwards. We'll just hang around, Megan and I. Uh, but I want other people to have time for the presentation. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, let me express my appreciation for being invited to speak here. My name is Louise Almadotter. No, I'm not Mexican. Um, <laughs> I'm American and in Jersey. Um, however, I've lived in Mexico for nine years. Um, I'm glad that I followed the first presentation because basically uh, I experienced most of just about everything the first presenters talked about and then culture clash on, on top of that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm in English as a foreign language teacher. And in that case here, um, I run into some opportunities as well as some problems. Because um, when you're teaching language, um, rather than a material, they always say that language classes are contentless um, material because what are you gonna talk about? Okay, we're gonna produce English, but you have to have something to talk about. Um, in this case here, so I'm not really teaching memorization. Um, so let me, uh, what the first presentation was about is I guess what you would now call the classic Wikipedia assignment, all right? You're going to substitute writing a Wikipedia article for the traditional term paper. The problem is what happens when your institution does not have traditional term papers, which many educational systems do not. Mine does not. Uh, not uh, basically, for undergraduates, uh, a lot of them don't write anything in their own words until they do a thesis. Can you imagine uh, if you're doing four years of college and now you have to write a thesis? Uh, I don't know how that works. But in my classes, it doesn't. Uh, they don't write papers. So what you're doing is, if you have them write an article, you're adding work rather than substituting work. And that was one of our first issues. Um, uh, so basically my question is, is article writing the only way for students to be involved in Wikipedia? And the basic answer is no. Um, by the way, m my name is very odd, which makes me very easy to find. I'm very easy to Google. <laughs> Let me move on to the next screen. All right, I am from an institution called the Instituto Tecnologico y Estudios Superiores de Monterrey. Nice big mouthful. Shortens either down to ETESM, for the initials, or Tech de Monterey, or just Tech. All right, so I tend to use these uh, interchangeably. This is our Wikipedia page for my campus. There are 31 campuses all over Mexico, and I am from the Ciudad de Mexico Sur, or the South Mexico City campus. There are three in the Mexico City area. Yes, I wrote that page, okay? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I won't tell if you are. Um, <laughs> so what I thought about, I actually started with Wikipedia on my own as a Wikipedian in 2007 after living in Mexico for several years and all of the towns started looking the same. You had your church, you had your main plaza, and you had the government building. And I was thinking to myself, okay, they can't all be the same. Okay, so I actually start, and also as another problem I had was that I am one of those weird foreign language learners who can write better than they can read, can speak better than can hear. I don't know why, no one's been able to explain it to me. Reading is very difficult for me in second language. I read faster than normal in English, but I read extremely slow in second language, in all the second languages I've studied. Uh, I only speak Spanish, by the way, uh, and sort of. <laughs> um, so I was, I, if I'm going to put a lot of effort into improving my reading skills, I want something to show for it. So I started reading about the places I see in Mexico in, because the information is in Spanish and started writing the articles in English language Wikipedia. Um, another reason for it is that even though I have an a, a undergraduate degree in Spanish, no one ever taught me how to write formally in Spanish. And unless you know how to write formally in that second language, you're going to run into problems which we ran into with my classes as well. So I thought about it and with, um, I, taught, I teach the upper language classes and the highest class that we teach at my school is called Seyo Bay, um, literally Seal B. Um, it's basically for students who have already met the foreign language requirement for English in order to graduate, which for those of you who are aware of TOEFL, the standard TOEFL is 550. Um, these students already have it, but they're required to take one English class in order to graduate. So that basically means I can do whatever th I want with these students because I don't have to worry about graduating because of the English requirement. So that gives me a lot of uh, uh, opportunity and freedom. So I decided one semester to say, hey, why don't you let me uh, use Wikipedia as a basis because um, there is a uh, theory that says uh, in order to improve foreign language skills, especially at the upper levels, um, you should be in a situation that requires you to use that language, all right? So those of you here who are not English language speakers are improving your English because you don't have any choice, all right? <laughs> Although I have a degree in Spanish, I didn't really learn to speak until I, I moved to Mexico. In fact, one of the first things people told me that when I came to Mexico, if I wanted to improve my Spanish, I needed a Mexican boyfriend, and there he is right there in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> most of us don't get to live in a foreign country, um, those of us st studying a foreign language, so how are we going to do it? Let's use it, well, the online. If you're in a chat room that only uses Spanish or whatever, you got to use that language or you're not going to communicate. Wikipedia, the, the lingua franca of Wikipedia is English. So, and then of course the obvious thing is have them write in English language Wikipedia. Mm, that could be problematic, okay, because if you don't know how to write formally, and you intend to, you're going to run into problems, which we did. Um, but what I wanted to do, more importantly, was the fact that Wikipedia is, is international. English is the lingua franca of the world, and therefore I wanted to teach my students that English is good for more than speaking with gringos. All right? Um, <laughs> so it is authentic communication. I am not just producing English to make my teacher happy. I am producing English in order so that I can learn how to do X, or I can make friends with so-and-so, or I need, to, I need to do communication in order to get some kind of result more than just producing grammar. Okay, great. So the idea was to focus on the community aspects of Wikipedia. Um, instead of just article writing, I put that in quotations, not to depreciate article writing. I know it's extremely important. There's so much that needs to be written. All of, uh, most articles written on Mexi uh, Mexico in English Wikipedia really are terrible. That's not the word I'm thinking, but I'll use the word terrible. Um, <laughs> even though I've written 400 of them that are a bit better, there's still a lot that isn't just there, simply because the information is in Spanish and most people in English wiki language Wikipedia don't have access to the information. Um, so the idea is obvious. Well, why don't I have my Mexican students write in English Wikipedia about Mexico? Oh, big problems, okay? Um, but I also wanted them communicating with other Wikipedians. The first time I attempted this was in 2007, long before we had a Wik uh, education program. And I had maybe been editing for a couple of months. Um, but mostly prompted by the success that it was helping me with my Spanish. So um, I said, great, let's do it. I go to my boss, I said, hey, let's have them do nothing but Wikipedia work for a semester, all right? Okay, so that's what I did. Oh, what a tiring experience for everybody all around. Um, 
The second time I did it, and I'm not, I'm not going to go more into it because um, I actually repeated the experience, which I want to talk about a little more um, in depth here. Um, I repeated it last semester, and the reason is um, I had four students come to me at the beginning of the fall semester saying to me, Miss, Sayo Bay that they put us in is just too easy. We're not going to get anything out of it. How many of you have ever had that experience? We had students come up and say, I want a harder course. <laughs> you did. It's a rarity, okay? And I jumped because if you've got students that say, I want to work, I will work with you. I actually took these four students on as an independent study and didn't get paid for it simply because I smelled opportunity in this. All right. And I said, fine, I had the course I did earlier. I'm going to modify it a little bit based on what I learned. And with these four students, it should work a little bit better because they're more motivated to do it, whereas these guys kind of got trapped the first time around. Unfortunately, we ran into a lot of the same problems. So motivation is not the only, uh, only key going on here. Um, but there's some things that we talked about. So we had advanced English students. They generally can speak English with me. Some of them have experience being in English language co uh, countries, usually the US. Um, however, another thing that I found that was interesting is using Wikipedia as a culture. When we think of culture, we think of art, and music, science, you know, things like that. But really, that's culture with a big C. Culture with a small C is values, norms, what's, what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do. Well, Wikipedia has all that. So you're going to throw students into a foreign culture, Wikipedia as a foreign culture, not because of the foreign language requirement, but because it's a completely new experience and you're going to run into culture shock. How many of you editing Wikipedia run into culture shock? I want to do it this way, they want to do it this way, and you argue and each one thinks the other is an idiot. Well, there you go. Okay? Um, <laughs> so we have values and norms. So we, we actually had readings about culture shock and culture clash and all of this kind of things and adaptations. Uh, to, get them uh, to get them prepared. We had them work as participating in the Wikipedia community, what they liked, what they didn't like, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the same issues that in the first presentation, people treated them really well, some people treated them like crap, all right? Same thing, culture clash. And the, per the, uh, the evaluation was done by portfolio. Again, culture clash. Mexican universities, especially the technological ones, do exams. It is memorize and regurgitate. I'm having students create. They were scared to death for their grades. All right? Yeah. So the full portfolio thing was very tough for these guys. So I, I was th when they were presenting earlier, I was thinking, oh my God, having uh, requiring that their grade depends on whether the Wikipedia community accepts their work, my guys would have died. Okay? There, I would have had administrators breathing down my neck on that. So that would not have worked because of the culture, because of the culture of the thing. Um, also the idea of creating new material, paraphrasing and synthesizing does not exist for these guys. Copy paste is what they have always done and gotten away with it. Okay? Again, it's a cultural clash, but we couldn't we couldn't get away with that. So that ran into some problems with the creation of articles. That doesn't mean we didn't do creation of articles. We did do some. But we actually did a number of things to, uh, to, to get around this and do things that, uh, that would allow them to have some feedback and some success, a feeling of success relatively quickly. So uh, I, I thought of other assignments to do. The first one, how many of you are aware of what GLAM is? Galleries, library, oh good, okay. Well, one of the first things that we did is that we hooked up with the Children's Museum. Is Lori Phillips around? Okay, Lori, that's Lori Phillips Museum. Um, and who wanted to do an edit-a-thon. This was way back in September, I believe. Uh, and they wanted to, they were gonna w write articles in English and they needed articles in Spanish. So guess what I volunteered my students to do, okay? Translation, I have found for foreign language teachers, anybody here teach foreign languages? Wonderful, do have them do translation into their native language. Find good articles or help them find good articles in English or whatever, have them translate to their native language because you'll teach them that coding problem, okay? When they translate over, they kind of get a feeling of what coding is and what citation is to be. Because most students don't even, if you've never done citation before, to having them explain where to put citation and why in text cit citation is important, they don't get it. But if you have them do translation, yeah, they get the feel because they're used to doing imitation. 
So anyway, um, we had what we did was that we were connected with Skype. There's Lori and the head of the Children's Museum there. And we were in, this is my laboratory, which seriously needs to be revamped, but that's beside the point. Um, and they were over in Indianapolis. So they were working on articles. The idea originally was they were going to work on the English version. We, would, we're, we were going to work on the Spanish version, but they couldn't get us the materials to cite in time. But they had already had a list of articles that they'd done before that needed to be translated. So basically, we were connected. They did translations of older articles. They were writing newer articles. But it was still worthwhile because the fact of the matter that the head of a, the largest children's museum in the world goes up and tells them, hey, we're really so happy you're doing this, was like, wow, OK? <laughs> it was very useful. The second project we did was uh, related to a Mexican festival. This is the largest international music festival in Mexico called the Festival Internacional Cervantino. It happens in Guanajuato uh, every October. And what we did, one of my students, one of my four students uh, had connections through the radio station that she works through with the Festival Cervantino. And we decided we were gonna set up articles that needed to be done about the uh, artists participating in that festival. It's short articles, nothing, nothing large or grand. And we were gonna do them in both languages. Uh, the idea being is that um, not only did we improve the festival's article in both languages, we would then have a whole bunch of artist articles that would go back to the festival and showing that marketing. One of my students was a marketing major, okay? If you have a whole bunch of artists that have then mentions back to the festival, the festival's article gets more articles, exactly. Um, which worked out very nicely. We got press passes for the four students to go attend the festival because of the work. <laughs> there are more done in English than Spanish because I'm crazy and I did a lot of them. <laughs> there was over about 200 artists that appeared that, that particular year. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't touch uh, all of them. One other thing we did, there's a little small picture of some of the students working on it. It wasn't just my four students. There was a, there's a uh, club Wikipedia, and some of the students outside of my class were working on this as well. Another thing I had them do was to contact the artists to try to get them to donate pictures for their articles. Interestingly enough, the first one is called En Plume. They're a French-Canadian uh, ensemble. The second one is the Peter Dorge New Jungle Orchestra from Denmark. We had fairly good response from well, we'll call them foreigners because we're in Mexico, or I'm in Mexico. We had, t we had zero cooperation from Mexican artists. The because as soon as you mentioned free license, okay, they wanted nothing to do with it, right? So I, there's a lot of work to do in, in Mexico to get them to realize that the publicity aspects override losing one, one photograph. Um, but this was an extremely good way for students to do something in English because even though you know they're from Canada and they're from Denmark, the language lingua franca was English. So they had to write in English in an authentic manner. That one worked out really well, as a matter of fact. Um, so basically, a uh, couple of lessons that we should talk about is that, okay, all student activities are with newbies. That, that's from our first presentation as well. They don't know what they're doing, and you have to be really slow and start, uh, and start with small, small things. Please do not have them write in their non-native language. Um, it's going to be terrible. I mean, I don't write in Spanish. I've been in Mexico for nine years. I refuse. After seeing what people can chew my language up, I'm too scared to even try it. Um, <laughs> Uh, so having them write in their native language is the best, plus the fact we need articles in other uh, languages other than English. Um, have students translate in English as a start, because translation really works out nicely. Consider outreach activities like GLAM. Have them go, and if you have any contacts with cultural and um, other organizations, by all means, have them do that uh, for, especially if you're in a culture that value, values social interaction. Okay, because students will be much more involved in it. Um, and activities outside of coursework. One of the major issues I ran into was, what about my grade? What about my grade? They're scared about the grade. They, they are very used to having do A, B, C, D, you get X grade. The idea of experimenting and as long as you put in effort, you'll get your grade. No, that will not work. All right, there's, there's, it's just t too alien for, for these guys. Um, one thing, a couple of things that I've started doing outside of, okay, uh, outside of, okay, 
one of the other things that I started experimenting with to get around that grade pressure, and a, a big recommendation I do have, any of you who are familiar with an education program real, re, re, uh, related to international baccalaureate, I know this is high school level. However, international baccalaureate is an extremely um, uh, exacting program, international, uh, that, a lot, that, for, that actually has, teaches students how to write papers. And if your student, and so if you're in a culture that doesn't do paraphrasing and synthesis, these students will have learned it because it's a requirement of that. Although they're younger, um, they're, they, they are also required to do 80 hours of community service work. Aha, uh -huh. so here we don't have to worry about the grade, they just have to do the number of hours, and as long as they show up when they're supposed to, they actually do work because, they, they, because, this is consi because it, uh, Wikipedia is in a nonprofit educational association, it qualifies for uh, uh, social service or CAS, CAS work. So I strongly recommend it for, um, uh, edu uh, for countries in which do not have a strong uh, writing or paper writing background for it. And that's my presentation. Well, with social 
uh, science, but uh, do you think we can use UV for other science like math or physics? I'm um, done it, but it's I'm, yeah, I'm not the person to ask for that. Uh, because uh, because I'm a contentless class, okay. quote unquote, um, we, uh, showing that they're learning the content is not really my part. My, my idea is to learn how to communicate. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then just the last question. Yes. Do you have the experience that students jump in in the last minute just because it's a new day for, for submission? Don't all students do this? So <laughs> 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 that, that's just normal. <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact, yes. And one of the things I had to do was every week they had to talk to me because I know that with, with communication with other Wikipedians, if they wait to the last minute, they will never get the response that they need. So I had to keep on them every single, every every class period. I was asking, what have you done? What have you done? And with four students, I had a lot of luxury in that. <laughs> yes? Uh, you mentioned the culture flash in terms of the yeah. The artists. Did you run into similar issues with the licensing of the students' contributions? No, the students didn't. or the university? Or no, in Mexico, that's not an issue. Okay. They're not really worried about that. Yes? I have a comment. You're awesome in <laughs> <laughs> Uh, g'day. Um, just now I feel like I should start this with and now for something completely different. Um, uh, my name is uh, Hilda Bastian and I work at the National Centre for Biotechnology Information at the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health, uh, just uh, a little bit out of here. Uh, and I'm going to uh, talk about systematic reviews and what they could do for uh, Wikimedia Medical, Wikipedia Medical pages. First, just a little bit about who we are. Uh, the National, US National Library of Medicine is the world's largest medical library. It was founded in 1836, and it's part of the National Institutes of Health campus. Uh, the, the NCBI uh, is a set of initials that a lot of people here will have seen quite often, um, and it's a division of the National Library of Medicine that creates resources for researchers, but also exists to support uh, public access to research materials and resources, uh, including uh, things like PubMed and PubMed Central. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about, in a sense, is, is uh, particularly is the issue of what is a reliable citation and trying to encourage people to start to see it uh, as something uh, that's a lot more stringent, perhaps, than, than people have been used to. Now, PubMed has over 21 million citations, but that doesn't actually mean uh, that every single one of them is a reliable source. And, and that's actually perhaps the, the, the prime thing that I sort of want to get across. What we're trying to do through PubMed Health, which is an initiative at the, at the NCBI and the National Library, is to say that we want to try and take the most reliable source of information about the effects of healthcare, create a resource out of that, and make it easier for people to use, uh, and encourage the greater use of that material. And I'll explain a bit why. Uh, one of those is that what we're, what I'll be calling a reliable systematic review uh, aims to minimise the bias at all key steps of asking questions and finding answers to those questions. This is pretty much important for everything, uh, but of course in health it's particularly important because at least some of the time people are making life and death decisions. Um, and uh, uh, getting, uh, getting a, a, a statement wrong about whether or not a treatment works or what it does uh, is actually quite, has, has actually quite serious uh, repercussions. And it's very, very, very hard to minimise bias uh, in any field at all, and certainly in research. Now, the, the, the whole process of moving towards having a very scientific process for reviewing literature and reviewing data uh, is something that's been going on for a few decades uh, and a science has been growing around it. And there are a growing number of organisations, including organisations that recommend what uh, uh, clinical practice guidelines should be, uh, but also increasingly what all health information should be based on, is to say it should really be based wherever possible on systematic reviews. One of the reasons that makes it, I don't really have time to go into all the reasons why, if you don't do a systematic review, if you do a non-systematic review, why you're, why you're actually quite highly likely to come up with the wrong answer. This is one of the reasons that makes that quite immediately uh, visible. Uh, medical research is doubling every seven years. The number of medical researchers is doubling every 20 years. And recent research has shown that just to take one study type, randomised trials, 
uh, for, a, for a single kind of topic area in medicine, uh, finding them for just the, the last few years can mean you've got to look, you, you'll have to find them in hundreds of journals. Those journals aren't all in the same database. Um, and some of them aren't even in published articles at all. They might be in trials registries in different places. So it's actually very, very easy to miss uh, very, very critical uh, information about the effects of healthcare. And only a quite sophisticated searching process uh, is going to give you a chance to unearth all of those bits of information. Now, these, this is what, uh, what we're meaning and defining uh, at PubMed Health as the, the methodological quality criteria of a systematic review. Now, some of these, you'll, you'll see in a, in a few minutes why uh, some of these are there. One is that it asks a pre-specified question, and it's a structured question, and that's clear, so that you don't change your mind about what it is that you're asking and you know, shift the goalposts when you're in the middle of the game. You, know, you decide up front. You should also decide up front what your systematic, me systematic methods are to find every potential eligible study that could answer the very specific question that you've asked and don't change those goalposts either. Uh, that you've pre-specified how you're going to select which studies go in and which you reject. That you assess the quality of included evidence. Because otherwise, when anybody comes and starts to use the review, uh, they're not going to know uh, really uh, how trustworthy different pieces of information are uh, without having to go back to the primary research themselves. And the goal of a good review should be that you don't actually have to go and reread all the primary research in order to, to know how much certainty or uncertainty is attached to different statements. Uh, and it should be clear how they're going to synthesise and interpret the results. All these and a few other things are part of the, of the overall package of things that you can do to try and minimise the bias when you're uh, researching research. Uh, now that may or may not include something called quantitative synthesis, synthesis which is a meta-analysis. Um, and uh, I've done a little rough sketch of uh, what we mean by that there. That, uh, that little graph on the side, sorry that I've got the, the, the one of the words obscured there a bit, but this is basically how the results of uh, four trials asking a very, si four s very similar trials asking a very similar question, how they come up with a particular answer. Each one of those horizontal lines represents one trial. Um, and the line down the middle uh, represents, uh, this is a treatment that has no effect uh, uh, for the outcome that they're looking at. So if it even touches that line, uh, it's possible uh, that, that this is not a significant result. Now, if you look at the fourth trial there, you'll see that that is on the side of saying this treatment is better, the people who use this treatment were, were better, uh, and it's not touching the line, and that's, that's clear. Um, but if you didn't see that trial, and only saw one, two, or three of the other trials, you'd get a different picture uh, of this treatment, depending, uh, any, any combination of those, of those four trials could get you a different answer. So PubMed Health is trying to help people find truly systematic reviews on the effects of healthcare interventions. That's a specific thing. So at the moment we're not trying to find systematic reviews that answer other questions like what's the cause of a disease? Does eating this cause that disease? Those kinds of questions. Um, we want to help people understand what they find, both the individual review and for more people to actually understand the science of systematic reviewing and how to understand those results and make sense of them. Uh, because it's a very, very, very complex uh, kind of form of science, really. How we're doing it, it's by saying we've got to create, or we're, and we're over 90% of the way there, a single search that includes all the likely to be good systematic reviews, um, wherever they may be published, whether they're in PubMed or not. Uh, so at the moment, there's more than 20,000 of them there for the last uh, 10 years, uh, and we'll keep it always roughly just the last 10 years. Uh, and knowledge translation materials. By that, I mean the kinds of resources that people produce to help people understand the results of the research. It might be a summary for consumers or clinicians. It may be uh, consumer information that's being based on systematic reviews. Um, it may be a, a critical appraisal, so a critique of the quality of that systematic review. And there's a real lot of that going on because systematic reviews are so complex. Uh, uh, quite a lot of people, so basically if you picture it this way, you've got people trying to do unbiased research, then you've got a different set of people 
sort of analysing that research and seeing how good is it and what does it mean. And then you've got another bunch of us that come along and say, how good is the meta research of the research? Right? <laughs> uh, these things are actually very helpful for you when you want to try and use research, uh, because if, if you either don't have time or you don't necessarily have the skills to find out you know, what the little floor is, it's great when somebody else has already done that. So we're trying to get those into uh, one place. And in addition, to start to create better educational resources about systematic reviews and what is reliable information in healthcare. Uh, this is what the website looks like. Uh, I won't explain all the different parts of it, but you'll see, uh, basically you just need to go there and start searching. Uh, but there's a, a section over on the right called Understand Clinical Effectiveness, and that's the very beginnings of us trying to create uh, open access and a range of other uh, public access resources, including full text of books and things that you can start to learn, uh, either consumers can or professionals can, uh, about understanding statistics, understanding uh, unbiased health research. Okay, so how are we creating a pre-selected database? I mean, typically what uh, PubMed does uh, is create, uh, collect everything, uh, and then have filters that you, you go through and try and find what you're looking for, which of course is actually very labour intensive because you end up with more things that aren't what you're looking for than, than are exactly what you're looking for. Uh, it's possible for systematic reviews, largely because of the group the, um, that uh, I've got up there on the left, and that is a, a, a group in England, the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination, that's funded by the NHS, and their job is to go with a whole lot of information scientists and other experts through all the world's literature. Um, they start off with you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, citations and go, th go through them, uh, conference proceedings, all sorts of things. So they're scanning the world's literature to find systematic reviews. Um, what they do is they end up with, uh, so I think it's about 15,000 a year or so, that they uh, say the probable systematic reviews and a good proportion of them after that somebody goes on and writes a very intensive critical appraisal of that. There's about half of them then come with an intense critical appraisal. Sometimes in that process, they'll say, oh, it didn't, it turns out it didn't really meet our criteria, but they're presumed to meet the criteria. So you have that database. They don't, however, analyze, pre-select uh, the other half of this pie uh, of systematic reviews. The blue one are reviews from the Cochrane Collaboration. They don't review them because uh, they and we and everybody else just assumes they already meet the criteria. Um, they won't, there'll be some that don't, uh, but the theory is they all do, and it's not worth going through them all to find uh, you know, the, the one or two that don't. Then uh, at the bottom, there's a, a thing called health technology assessment. That's a really growing uh, uh, activity around the world, particularly from governments, to say, okay, when we start to make a decision like, do we fund this healthcare treatment or not, we cannot afford to make a mistake uh, as to whether this treatment works. Uh, and they put, uh, you know, sometimes they can, uh, a million dollars can be spent in two years reviewing a single question uh, to get the right answer. Those things are all completely open access, but of course the health, these government agencies uh, are not, some of them will also be publishing in journals, but most of them have no reason to do that. Um, and so these things are published uh, on uh, government websites and so on around the planet. Um, and there's a, a, an international database of those, but they haven't been selected. And not everything that a health technology assessment agency does is a systematic review, and not everything that every review that they do is systematic. For example, if they need an answer to something in six weeks or whatever, they'll do some other kind of review. Uh, and nobody selects those out, and we're doing that now from NCBI so that a complete collection is possible. So we're going health technology assessment agency by health technology assessment agency, and with them uh, coming up with these are the ones that meet the criteria and they're going into PubMed Health. Mostly it means we have to digitise them um, because they're produced in uh, PDFs and so on. So we're digitising them and getting them into PubMed Health. Uh, for the ones that aren't published in English, will just be taking their uh, English executive summaries and, and uh, uh, digitising those. So I gave some thought to, okay, how, how could, and, and this is going to be something that we're really hoping that, that we'll be able to collaborate with uh, uh, Wikipedians on, uh, how can we, uh, you know, how can we make this process uh, support the work that uh, people are doing in uh, Wikipedia? So I took uh, a medical stub 
uh, this one, Urge Incontinence, um, and I, if, if you, you don't really need to be able to read those references, but they're, they're clearly actually not suitable for the purpose, which is why it's a, a, a stub. And I thought I'd go through a relatively this simple procedure to see more, to give you an idea of, well, what do you come up with if you, uh, if you use PubMed Health to try and find uh, systematic reviews uh, relevant to this topic? So the, f the first thing that uh, you'd ordinarily recommend is to look for systematic reviews that have been published in the last three years. There's quite a bit of research that shows that by the time three years is up, if it's, a, if it's a issue of clinical research, that's this is the point at which most information is starting to go out of date, and the chances that the conclusions are wrong are going to start to increase. Now, if it's an area where people don't really do trials much anymore, that's not going to be the case. And for some things where there's a lot of uh, research going on, it's going to happen an awful lot sooner than three years. In fact, by the time they publish it, it's probably out of date. Uh, but as a rough rule of thumb, that's what you'd first be looking for. Um, your next thing is to check that the date they searched to the, uh, for research isn't years before the date of publication of the review. Um, because that can be, you know, it can sometimes take five years for somebody to get an article published. Well, it's certainly out of date by the time it was published. In addition, what we do to try and make up for a whole lot of issues in PubMed Health is that when you search PubMed Health, at the same time, you're searching PubMed uh, and the systematic review filter in PubMed. Um, just again, a note that most of the hits that you get from that will not actually be systematic reviews. Um, so that would be your first step, to see what, what, uh, what you get. This is a screenshot of what the search result was uh, yesterday for urge incontinence in PubMed Health. At the moment, you'll see there's a shaded area there. Uh, that's either systematic reviews or information based on systematic reviews. It's not entirely logical at the moment, uh, uh, and uh, in, a, in a couple of months it, it will be much more uh, logical and easier to use. So, for example, there's a category there, full text reviews, uh, but the category clinical guides, most of the things in there are full text systematic reviews as well. So it's a uh, it's, a, it's a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit awkward at the moment. Um, but nevertheless, uh, if you just go through all, you'll, you'll see uh, um, the systematic reviews and information that's based on. Over on the right, where the red arrow is pointing, uh, you'll see the, the systematic review search results. The search in the middle is a relevance-based search. Uh, the search on the right is chronological, so the most recent up at the top. Uh, if you click uh, right down over the right, you'll say it says see all 115, that takes you into PubMed and you'll see the search results in PubMed. Um, and, uh, and then you've left PubMed and you're in, uh, left PubMed Health, you're in PubMed. You'll, you'll see up next to the search box, anybody who used PubMed a lot, uh, that's exactly the same search box that you'll see in PubMed and you can shuttle backwards and forth, you can change which database you're, you're searching in up there. That's the first step. Now this is an example, and I don't know how well uh, the internet's going to work. I, I uh, realised yesterday after I'd already picked this one that this was a bit of a, a, a whopper to have chosen. It was uh, uh, not intended to be. Uh, this is an example, the first one is an example of a full text systematic review from PubMed Health. Um, as it happens, if I were to click on this, and just because of time, I, I won't even uh, try, and it might uh, challenge the internet too much, that one actually turns out to be 1,200, over 1,200 pages long, um, and we digitise it. So be careful what you wish for when you wish for open access, full text uh, science. Um, that, uh, that can happen with a systematic review. Uh, beneath that is an example then of a, of a review that I picked, uh, because it's a free uh, review in PubMed Central, but that wouldn't meet the cri didn't meet DARE's criteria. It wouldn't meet ours for systematic review. Um, but it's addressing a different question too about the epidemiology of uh, incontinence and so on. So that's what I mean that you can start to see uh, reviews on different questions than effects of interventions uh, in PubMed. This is an example of what a DARE appraisal looks like, and that's really the next step. Uh, you know, if, if somebody has critiqued the quality of the systematic review, that's a useful thing to know, uh, especially if you've got a little group of systematic reviews. You could have four sometimes that uh, have different conclusions, you know, so, uh, you know, dealing with that can be quite challenging. Um, if there's a DARE appraisal, that's one of the first things uh, to look at. Um, now, this one, if you clicked on it and saw the full one, uh, you'd basically say, 
uh, you, you'd see quite a lot of information, including uh, all the key data from the systematic review. That's quite valuable because this review is not published in an open access journal. So if you don't have access to the Journal of the American Asso uh, Medical Association, you're going to get pretty well all the information you need from the critical appraisal of that review. They're basically saying uh, it's uncertain whether uh, you should rely on the results of that review. Uh, so it could save you a, a, a lot of bother and $35 or whatever JAMA costs. So uh, after that, uh, one of the important things is to always check uh, for any review how good is the evidence for each conclusion you want to use it for. Um, because generally speaking, what happens in health is that we may be uh, quite certain about one outcome, um, but very uncertain about another. Uh, so it could be that we can say this definitely works for this, uh, it maybe works for this, and we still really don't know about this other thing. Um, and so it's really quite important to keep thinking. Uh, you know, you, you don't ever have an answer for an intervention overall. You only have an answer for a specific outcome. Uh, and then you can search for additional information in there that we've selected out from information partners that might be useful for you for external links or further reading for other people. Um, what if you don't uh, find systematic review that's answering the question that you uh, want answered? Uh, you can try and use the PubMed systematic review filter, as I've sort of already explained. That can help you find more recent systematic reviews that haven't yet made it into PubMed Health, because obviously there's some process, you know, it can take quite a bit of time to go through DARE and all those sorts of things. Um, and as I said, for, for subjects other than the effects of interventions, um, there's a very small time lag for DARE getting into PubMed Health. It's much shorter than the time lag for DARE getting into other places. Uh, but if you're really, really uh, mm -hmm. desperate for something, it could be worth searching uh, in DARE as well. All of these um, logo things are uh, clickable when you uh, get access to the slides. You can find where these things are. And you can go and start looking through the International Health Technology Assessment Database yourself. What we're trying to do, I'll just fly over this now. This is uh, uh, clearly one of our goals, is to try and get as complete, uh, as complete a set of access to as much open access material as we possibly can and digitise as much of it as we possibly can. Uh, this now is a, a related search in PubMed, not PubMed Health. Um, and you'll see, for example, that you, you've got a category over on the right where the arrow is that says here's full text articles in PubMed Central, and the arrow on the bottom is an example of that kind of thing. But uh, the, the first one is actually the same, uh, I think it's the same whopping review that I was showing before, it says books and documents. That, that's something that we've digitised and put into books and documents. So once we've digitised a systematic review and put it in PubMed Health, then we put it, uh, it goes into PubMed. Okay, so that was really what I wanted to say about PubMed Health and systematic reviews. Um, we're very keen to develop a relationship with, the, with your community. Um, these are sort of some starting off points that we're interested in uh, potentially working, on people, uh, working with people on. One of those, the first one, is about optimising PubMed functions. We're starting to add different PubMed functions to PubMed Health. And as we do that, we want to see how, uh, you know, whether we can improve them. Um, specifically from the point of view of people who need to keep up with a particular topic, for example, cite it, those kinds <coughs> of things. So we're going to be very interested in, uh, in working with people who are interested in how to keep better up to date uh, with emerging evidence. We're interested in seeing whether there's uh, whether it's worthwhile for us to develop resources about systematic reviews and searching and helping people uh, create searches in my NCBI or other ways uh, for them to be able to get the, the kinds of research that can answer the questions that they want, uh, as well as reliable information based on them. So if there's an interest, that's something that we're willing to work with people on. Uh, and of course, we're interested in improving the accessibility uh, of our resources, uh, all NCBI resources and Wikimedia. Uh, um, that's how you can get in touch with me, and that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. No. 
No, the, the question was if we had any uh, Wikipedians come in and, and uh, work with us. Uh, Daniel came in uh, to, my, uh, to NCBI yesterday and gave a talk, but no, we haven't yet. Um, uh, this is really, uh, for us, the start. Right. Um, on the English Wikipedia, we have a, a, a guide there. Um, and it Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, it was one of the things that I was looking at, both the, the section on identifying reliable resources and then also the information on systematic reviews and Cochrane reviews and those sorts of things. Um, uh, yes, I would have. Uh, um, I would have some suggestions, uh, and I. Uh, uh, yes, I would like to make them. Yes. Yes. So to some extent, uh, uh, perhaps part of your, uh, if you're asking if, if there's somewhere where somebody has kind of published a critical appraisal of, of existing research that some people are saying this is a really important piece of research, where do you find the thing that tells you are they right or wrong? Uh, um, that's, a, that's a process that, uh, that, that really involves, and I, I think on one of the slides I said you can try and search in Google and so on for critical appraisals like that. Um, it's actually not that, that hard because when you actually really put in a very specific citation, um, you really do get quite specific uh, results, um, and then you can sort of see public uh, discussion of those. Uh, we don't as yet. We don't as yet have it. Sorry. Well, well. It's, yeah, it's 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 not free, and it's a it's a, it's not necessarily written by it's it's a, that's a bit more like going to read letters to the editor of something. Uh, what what we're talking about here is sort of saying you've got a, a process of people having done a very rigorous critical appraisal uh, with a set of standards against uh, an article. Um, I want and a stamp on the article from another review. I want a stamp on it saying this has been approved. Well, for the, know, for the, the if we could submit two user reviews, I think that would be a huge step forward. Because we have people who come and they want to use primary research. Mm -hmm. They want to use randomized controlled trials. You know, someone is trying to use a trial comparing fox trot versus um, versus the walls for treating Parkinson's disease. They, you know, there's a study of 20 people and the trial concluded fox trot was better. It's, you know, and then they tried to add it to our article on Parkinson's disease. Yes. I removed it six to ten times. Uh, because it's just not appropriate. And people don't understand that, that review articles, a review article and a peer reviewed article are two separate yeah. issues. A re, you know, just because it's peer reviewed doesn't mean it's a review article and doesn't mean that you can use it on Wikipedia. And we at Wikipedia has to require review articles by and large. And that's why I want the stamp of approval of this. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it, those are the kinds of uh, ideas that, that, that would be you know, ideal for feeding into how we go with this. I mean, at the moment, uh, I'm concentrating on working out how do I get the, the, the people who do this as information partners and start to gradually get them into uh, PubMed Health and start tagging them onto the reviews and all that kind of stuff. The, within a couple of months, when you come to a systematic review in PubMed Health, it's not like that now, but in a couple of months, you'll come to the review, you'll see the review, and you'll see attached to it all the associated forms and pieces of, of information that, that have accrued with that piece of uh, with that piece of research. Um, but uh, but perhaps too, we could already start to say here is actually the list of people who do that. Um, so you know where you can go looking for those stamps of approval. At the moment, I'd say PubMed Health is a stamp of approval. <laughs> Thank you. 
with the papers who are doing that sort of analysis. We want to rely on somebody yep. who we trust to have the expertise mm -hmm. to make those sorts of judgments for us so we can just report them. I know that sounds like being idle, but that's really, no. really, really what we need. <laughs> No, I, I, I think it's a, it, it's a real thing to, to sort of be, be faced with a 1,200-page document and, uh, and, and claim to be able to say whether it's good or not uh, in a short period of time is, 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 is yeah, it's a bit of hubris, really. Yeah. Yes, I hear you. We can, definitely, it's, we can definitely work on that. I think a lot of the same line is that we can extend the scope beyond just documents that are immediately would be the primary articles for the articles that feed into these link back to their views. Yes. So someone who's searching for a topic and finds an article where they think it might be reliable or is thinking about including this, this 20 person setting random life study could then see if it has been part of a review. And, and so that we have as we speak and don't to say, well, can you find this in a review and that's your problem? Or can I as a teacher say, well, you're citing this to prove a point, but the review of this article says it doesn't really support that point. You're not the expert that the experts handle. Yes, well this is, this is 40 people, but here are five other trials that have each got 200 people in it and they say something different, you know, which is, which is uh, one of the other things that, that you can see with it. Yes, and I mean, in, in the ideal world that we kind of uh, dream about uh, um, sometimes at NLM is, you know, the, the trial goes into a register, from the register already we've got everything linked up to, everything linked up to everything that's hard in a world that's non-digitised and non-open access. Um, because if you uh, think about that uh, that pie chart I showed you, you know, Cochrane Journal alone, well, it's not open access. You you can't mine the included studies uh, without getting into issues about it. So um, you know, so, so there are a whole lot of uh, there are a whole lot of issues. Some of them are technical, and some of them are are you know other kinds of issues. Uh, that stand in the way, but that's definitely something that we'd like to do. Our first step, though, is to get the systematic, re the systematic reviews and the things directly at that level together, and then we can start to tackle the, the next level. If they're in PubMed, it, 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 wor it works, but... If you go from the systematic review, you can get a list of all the articles, all the original research. If we've digitised it, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, well, if, we, if we've digitised if we've digitised it in the bookshelf, uh, then we do that. Uh, but otherwise, we're we're uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.